this wonderful resurrection day of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, people have been saying to me um, online and different things, Happy Easter. Don't use that word. It's um, in violation of the word of God because it's a foreign deity. In other words, it's demonic and devilish. So let's not say Happy Easter because nothing is happy about the devil and his stuff. <laughs> but about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he is something else. The one question that believers have to answer, everybody in the world has to answer this question. It's, I guess if you'd say this is the most profound question in the whole world, you've probably all been asked profound questions. But this is the most profound and everybody has to have an answer for it. Did Jesus raise from the dead? Did Jesus really, 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 really raise from the dead? That is the big question. And do you remember when Pilate was interviewing Jesus? And Pilate said, what is truth? Now, Truth is the baseline in life. If we don't respect and love truth, then we can't have a heart to truly love and respect Jesus Christ. Everything is about following the truth. I had an incident happen when I was in college. My favorite professor, he was uh, the French professor. He was the head of the French department, and I was a getting a degree in French, and I was getting another degree in English, and I respected him so much. He wore a three-piece suit. He was just a magnificent man. He was handsome and tall and good-looking, little gray on the temples. But during that year, he went off and started, and he did something illegal. And so this man of great honor fell from grace, so to speak, and he was imprisoned. And it broke my heart because I respected him so much. He said that he couldn't have known truth. He couldn't have known truth for what he did, the illegal thing he did. Here he has all this posh and circumstance. He's the head of the French department at this huge university. Everybody loves and admires him. And he gets involved in something illegal and he goes to jail. So I interceded for him. I prayed and prayed and prayed for him. And I said, Lord, please get him out of jail. He doesn't deserve this. And you know what the Lord said to me? He said, him who I have shut up. It's a, it's a verse in Job. He said, him who I have shut up, I have shut up. And that man got broken unto Christ. He got broken unto the truth. And I know that, I don't know how long he served, but I do know this, that he got saved and he's in heaven. He finally saw what it, truth is. So believers, you know, right now, it's relativism is the rampage in life. Everything is relative to the mores, the desires, the hopes, the dreams of people. That is not okay with Jesus because Jesus Christ is the truth and he's the center of the universe. People need to understand that. I want to talk to you about the resurrection. Let's pick it up in John 3. We have to build a foundation. Our foundation is always built on Jesus. There is no other foundation. Jesus Christ is Lord. This is the crux of why Jesus was crucified, but why he had to be resurrected. So whoever believes in him will have eternal life after physical death and will actually 
live forever. This is the AMPC, Amplified Bible. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave his one and only begotten son so that whosoever believes and trusts in him as savior shall not perish but shall have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge. Not at this point he didn't. God did not send his son into the world to judge, to condemn the world, that is to initiate the final judgment of the world, but that the world might be saved through him. You know, I don't know how many people in this congregation witness to people about the Lord. How many of you are actively trying to get people saved? I find the most asinine um, reasons for not accepting Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We want to honor your son, Jesus Christ. We do honor you, Lord. We bow before you. We take off our golden crowns and we throw them at your feet in Jesus' name. We're so elated that you died for us, that you had the courage to die for us and suffer that horrible pain and actually become sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Would you help us honor Jesus and thank him and praise him and worship him because now we are seated with Christ in heavenly places and we're so thrilled about that position and we thank you so much. When I talk to people about the Lord, they have so many nonsensical answers. You, it's, it's so hard to fathom anybody not wanting Jesus when you tell them Point blank. When you die, you're either going to go to heaven or hell. If you choose Jesus, you'll go to heaven. And people mutter and sputter. You've probably experienced this, Scotty. I mean, they give you the, the, the strangest answers. But God sent his son so that we would not perish. 1 Corinthians 15 We wonder if there's proof that Jesus was risen from the dead. And there is proof. Chapter 15 says the facts of Christ's resurrections. His resurrection. Now, brothers and sisters, let me remind you once again of the good news of salvation. You know, when you talk to some people, they act like it's not good news. You have to persist with people, not in a in a wrong way, a rude way, but you have to persist with them. Now, brothers and sisters, let me remind you once and again of the good news of salvation which I preached to you, which you welcome and accepted and on which you stand by faith. We stand by faith that Jesus Christ was resurrected. Many of us have seen him. Many of us, well, all of us commune with him daily and we hear him talk to us and we talk to him. By this faith you are saved, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, and set apart for his purpose if you hold firmly to the word which I preach to you. Unless you believed in vain, just superficially and without complete commitment. There will come a time between now and the time we step off this earth when we will have to hold firmly to the word that we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. There will come a time we will be tested. And you will have to know that you prefer death rather than to deny Christ. We, each one of us have to come to that reality within our hearts because that day is coming. For I passed on to you as of first importance, what I received, that Christ died for our sins according to that which the scripture foretold, Isaiah 53. 
And he that was buried, and that he was bodily raised on the third day according to that which the scripture foretold in Psalm 16, 9 and 10. And that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, and to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 brethren and sisters at one time, the majority of whom are still alive, but some have fallen asleep in death. Then he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely, prematurely, traumatically born, he appeared to me also. This is Paul talking. Jesus died. All those who saw Jesus alive were so many. Jesus is our friend. He's our master. He's our savior. Our goal is always to commit our life to worshiping him at all times. Jesus bought us by his precious blood, Acts 4, 33. This is a result of the resurrection of Christ. Think about what we would not have if Jesus wasn't resurrected. We wouldn't have the new birth. We would all have to go to hell. We couldn't have the baptism in the Holy Spirit because we haven't been born again. You can only receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit if you're born again. We wouldn't have a covenant of healing because Jesus would still be in the grave. He wouldn't have been raised. There wouldn't be a covenant of blessing. We are under the covenant of blessing. We wouldn't have a covenant of wealth or prosperity. I'm not talking the kind of prosperity that you go out and rook people to get money. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about worshiping Jesus and Jesus amply supplies for us. All these issues we would not have at our disposal. They, we would just go to the grave and die and go to hell if Jesus hadn't raised from the dead. We need to know whether he did or not. Verse 32, now the company of believers was of one heart, one soul. This is a book of Acts, so all the believers are gathered together. And not one of them claiming that anything belonged to him was exclusively his own. Can you imagine that kind of selflessness? They were so generous. You know why they were that generous? Because they were totally in love with Jesus. People who are really, really in love with Jesus, they don't mind letting loose of the things that they own because they prioritize their lives and their loves and Jesus is always first. So I wanna ask you this question, is he first with you? We have to come to this that we know that we have no other loves before him. Look at verse 33. And with great ability and power, the apostles were continuously testifying to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace, God's remarkable loving kindness and favor and goodwill rested richly upon them. I don't think we testify enough to his resurrection. I think we need to delve into his resurrection so we can tell people why we believe that he was resurrected. And if we lovingly tell people about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Lord will give great grace, remarkable loving kindness and favor and goodwill, and it will rest upon us. Let's go to John 18. People give you the funniest excuses why they aren't saved. Jesus was talking to Pilate. Pilate said, what is truth? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, nor does it have its origins in this world. 
If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting hard to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. If we could get people to see Jesus is not just an average person who hung upon the cross. He's the son of God. He's the Messiah. So Pilate said to him, you say you are a king? And Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. You know, Jesus didn't very often claim kingship. He didn't very often. To the woman at the well, he told her that he was the Messiah, the Christ. You won't find many passages where he says that. He called himself the son of man because he was so humble. You know, when Jesus came to walk the earth, he came humbly. He was extremely humble. He was meek. And meekness means great power under great control. Jesus had extreme control. When they were flogging him, he didn't cry out. He didn't scream in pain. He didn't protest. He took the beating that was meant for us. People who go to hell are taking the beating that Jesus already took for them. I want to encourage you. Pastor Stephanie mentioned this, but I want to encourage you to listen to online Mary Baxter's Divine Revelation of Hell. Jesus comes and takes her to hell. And hell, here's what hell consists of, at least in this portion. There's also outer darkness, which is far deeper place in hell. And there are people, they're always caged, and they're standing in a pit of fire, and the fire keeps coursing up throughout their whole body. They're standing in a pit of fire. The flesh is burned, of course, they don't have flesh, but they have their spirit bodies. It's like flesh, and it's always just hanging and dangling off their skeleton form. And people give the most ridiculous reasons why they chose hell. They didn't say, I'm choosing hell, but they didn't choose Jesus. One woman was a famous movie star. I kind of have a hunch who she was. And Jesus came to her, I believe she's the one he came to her when she was 16, and kept wooing her and saying, I love you, come and serve me. I want to use you in the ministry. I will help you. I will guide you. And she said to Jesus, Jesus, I love what I'm doing. She was serving Satan. She said, I love the fame and the fortune. I love the, the men swarming around me, so to speak. She loved all that more than she did Jesus. Every person that they went to, because he took Mary 30 times, three hours every night, and they visited different sections of hell. Every time the person, there was one who was a pastor of a church, and he was a good pastor for a while, and then he started taking money from the offering. I mean, you don't touch the Lord's money, not if you want to live long. And he started getting off on doctrine and teaching really bad doctrine. What I'm saying is we have to understand that Jesus Christ is the only way, and we've got to tell. I, I, do you have the boldness to talk about the Lord when you go out on the street? I do. Scotty does. Who else does? You do. You do. I know you do, Aldora. You do, Pastor Stephanie. The rest of you have to get the boldness, and if you don't have it, you have to ask God to give it to you. When Jesus rose from the dead, he confirmed his identity as the Son of God and his work of atonement, redemption, and reconciliation. One of my main gripes when I hear Christians talking is that they call themselves a sinner. That means your sin nature wasn't taken away from you by the blood of Jesus and by 
Jesus, accepting Jesus into your spirit. When Jesus Christ came into your spirit and you were born again, your sin nature, you no longer had a sin nature. Now you have a righteousness conscious nature. You're born again. So don't ever say, correct people when they say that because they shouldn't be confessing that they're sinners. The resurrection of Jesus was real, literal, physical. And it was the entire raising of Jesus' body in the resurrection. Here's what thrills me about the resurrection. When Jesus hung upon that cross, he paid the price for sin. He paid the penalty for everybody's sin. Then he went to hell and he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from the devil. How did the devil get those keys? Do you remember in the Garden of Eden, God gave to Adam a charge. He gave him authority. Read Psalm 8. What is man that you are mindful of him? He's a little lower than the angels. God gave man so much authority on the earth so he gave to Adam the keys of the kingdom in that he told Adam, you keep and guard this garden. Well, Adam didn't do it. You notice Adam, Adam did not do that. Why was the thief, why was the robber, why was Satan, why was Lucifer in the garden? If Adam was given that charge and didn't obey it, that's why Eve was tempted. People like to blame Eve first, but actually it was Adam. The Bible says he disobeyed a, a positive command. God commanded him way before Eve was even created from man. He said, keep and guard the garden. Well, he didn't. So Lucifer came in and convinced Eve, and Adam was standing right there, to eat of the tree that was forbidden. And then their natures fell. Their spirits, they were no longer worthy of being in paradise. That's when the keys of authority were handed to the devil. And Satan became the god of this world. You notice in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Lucifer is called the, the god of this world. That's exactly when Adam gave the keys to Lucifer. So Jesus, I think sometimes about the eons of eternity past. I've tried desperately to find out how God got here. I've questioned him. He doesn't really answer me on that. He couldn't explain it to me. If he could, because I wouldn't understand it. But they were here for eons past. God wanted a family and have you ever thought about this fact? I wonder how many eons of time until they started earth. And there was, there was a prophet and God took him back in time. It was a word of knowledge by a wisdom, by a word of knowledge, by a vision. And Jesus told him, was, handing the, was holding the world in his right hand. Think about it. Jesus was. And he said to the prophet, watch this. And he threw the world, the globe, our globe, out into space. And then he went, ta-da. I mean, Jesus is a real person. He has a sense of humor. Sometimes in great stress, I have had him tell me jokes. He's a lovely, lovely resurrected Christ. Jesus said to Pilate, you are a king, Pilate asked. You say correctly, I am a king. That is why I was born. For this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. I wish truth was our standard. I remember in college when relativism came into popularity, where everything was relative. When we grew up, the tr truth was absolute king. I mean, you told the truth. That's what you admired was the truth. And now it's relativity. Anything goes. When Jesus comes, 
especially, of course, he'll take us out in the rapture. But when Jesus comes in this second coming, his eyes will be blazing fire. And every person who believed that truth is relative, they will suffer the loss of their souls. Truth is not relative. I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth, who is a friend of the truth. Isn't that a beautiful way to say it? Are you a friend of the truth? Are you a friend of relativity? Oh, come see, come saw. It could be this way, it could be that way. It depends upon the environment and the time. No, it doesn't. Truth is truth. Anybody who is a friend of truth and belongs to truth hears and listens carefully to my voice. Pilate said to him scornfully, what is truth? If a person has to ask that question, then they know nothing about truth. Let's go to Daniel. Daniel 7. Daniel was a man of impeccable integrity. And you know one of the ways God tested him was told him to fast a lot. This is one of the ways that God turns us into spiritual giants, turns us into strong spiritual people by telling us to fast a lot. Have you ever thought about that? People who don't fast a lot and eat a lot are carnal. They're usually carnally minded. Daniel fasted a lot. And the revelations, think about it. He fasted with vegetables. That's not even hard to go without food and just eat vegetables. That's not even a hard fast. That's the easiest fast in the world. There's a gentleman in Christian circles who has fasted, gone on, I believe, 40, 40-day 40 fasts with water. But oh, the miracles. And oh, the relationship with Jesus. I'm not saying this is for everyone. We have to be led. But Daniel was an astonishing man because he fasted. There's a place you come to in God when you fast. It seems like the weights, the carnal weights just fall off. The carnal thinking falls off. Everything that is against God just kind of falls off. And you come into newness of life. You come into a place where you're remodeled by the Holy Spirit. When we allow the Holy Spirit to take over our being, so to speak, in other words, we yield to him, and we pray much in other tongues, and then we read the Bible all the time because Jesus Christ is the living word. We want to get him in our spirits to full measure. So Daniel was an outstanding gentleman because he fasted a lot and he always sought the Lord. Those are the two keys to getting to places in God that we've only dreamed of. Look at uh, 7 verse 9, Daniel 7 verse 9. And it starts, it's introduced with this caption, the ancient of days reigns. I kept looking until thrones were set up and the ancient of days, God took his seat. This is God the Father. His garments, his garment was white as snow and the hair of his head were, was pure, like pure wool. His throne was flames of fire, its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from him. What do you suppose that river of fire does as it comes out from his throne? And we come to the throne daily? We should park right at the throne. God told me years ago, make a nuisance of yourself in front of my throne. Get all you can get. Fasten your eyes on me, so to speak, and never let me go. Whatever you want, he said, come to me and stay there. 
Yes, we have to go off and do other things. But our position is in front of the cross, feasting off God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the way we really grow. This is the way we become strong spiritually. We never leave his presence. We have other things that we have to do. But don't you take them along with you? It's a secret to practice the presence of God at all times. So at all times, you're just tuned into him in front of his throne. At all times, you're tuned into Jesus. You practice it and practice it. Practice makes perfect. Until you can feel and sense, sometimes even see Jesus. You can see the throne. And you never let God go. For whatever it is that you're after with God, you never let him go. You stay right there with him and you bring his word to bear. And you prove him on his word. Not in arrogance or pride, but you say to him, your word said it, I believe it. You promised me all your promises are yea and amen in Christ. Lord, and never let God go. He said to me a while back, whatever you need, whatever you want from God, go to his throne, never let him go. You have to do other things, go do them, come back, never let him go. Bring scripture to bear, bring those principles of his word and those promises and put them before him and never let him go until you get what you want. Never. But we have to couple that with praise and worshiping him because that says, that's the yea and amen that we, have, we believe we have received. That's Mark eleven twenty four. Believe that you have received and you shall have it. It's a secret, it's a treasure to have God always, to always be in the presence of God one way or another. It's a treasure. Wherever you are, you can look up and there you are with God. Practice this. It becomes a daily habit that you have to be with God. So out of his throne, a river of fire was flowing. We need to ask God to set us on fire. There are Christians who are so lackluster and dull they never read their Bible. They don't pray. They're not gung-ho about Jesus. And if they don't watch out, they will not make the rapture. Well, what's the, what do we do? Well, a fire was flowing and coming out from before him. And so we ask him to set us on fire. This is the resurrected Christ that we are dealing with. He's in his spirit body. He's resurrected. We have access to him at all times. He's not dead. He's not in the grave. A thousand thousands were attending him and 10,000 times 10,000 were standing before him. The courts were seated and the books were open. Now look, jump down to verse 13. We wonder, is Jesus resurrected? Daniel was 10 generations, born 10 generations before Jesus Christ. Now, Daniel is having this vision. He's seeing into the future. 10 generations. Verse 13. The Son of Man is presented. I kept looking, this is Daniel talking, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, on the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him, the Messiah was given dominion, supreme authority. When Jesus descended into hell and took the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from the devil, then he ascended and he gave the keys of the kingdom to the church. Glory and kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and speakers of every language should serve and worship him. To him 
the Messiah was given dominion and supreme authority. Go to Matthew 16. We need to know, was Jesus raised from the dead? Daniel saw him raised from the dead. Ten generations before he was even born. Daniel, or excuse me, Matthew 16. Jesus, picking up in verse 13. Now when Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Jesus was so humble, he always called himself the Son of Man. And they answered, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, or just one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, the son of the living God. Then Jesus answered him, blessed, happy, spiritually secure, favored are you. Simon, son of, of Jonah, because flesh and blood Mortal man did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter and on this rock. Now, here's where certain religions get this wrong. They now say Peter is the rock. And they call him Saint Peter and they say he is the rock that Jesus built on, Saint Peter. No, what he, Jesus is saying is this. I say to you that you're Peter, but on this rock of revelation that I am the Messiah, the son of God, I will build my church. That's the rock, Peter's not a rock. In fact, Peter's name meant small stone. But there is a certain religion that has twisted this to say that now Peter is a, a bishop or whatever, they made him bishop. When we went to Italy, we went to the Vatican there was a statue, a statue of St. Peter, and everybody who walked by rubbed the, his foot, rubbed his foot, rubbed his foot. Well, his foot was partially gone. So many people had rubbed it. And he was the one lauded as somebody great because of this verse that people have misread. Isn't that interesting? So you should read it. I say to you that you're Peter. You've had this revelation. And on this revelation that I am the Christ, the Messiah, on that rock of revelation, I will build my church. And the gates of hell and death will not overpower it by preventing the resurrection of Christ. Did you, did you hear that? The gates of hell or death will not overpower it. I will build my church and the gates of Hades or hell will not overpower it by trying to prevent the resurrection of Christ. Isn't that interesting? Jesus had to go to hell to, to take our sin. He had to be crucified. In fact, when Jesus hung upon the cross, there were three hours of darkness. That's when Jesus became sin for us. All the lights went out. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? David prophesied that 10 centuries before that Jesus would say those words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So the rock of revelation is that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Not that Peter has anything to do with anything. He was just a man. And he denied Jesus three times. That's how human he was, just like the rest of us are human. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it by preventing the resurrection of the Christ. When Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says he sweat great drops of blood. You know, look at it both ways. He was in anguish that he had to go to the cross, the terror of that pain. You would sweat great drops of blood over that, wouldn't you? 
But on the other hand, he sweat great drops of blood that something would prevent him from going and being nailed to that cross because he knew he had to finish his mission. He had to be nailed to that cross because all of our sins were nailed with him. And you can understand his dilemma. He's all man, he's all God, hypostatic union. He's one person, but he's all God, all man. I'm sure the blood of God, God doesn't really have blood, but his pure, spotless, sinless blood ran through his veins. So the keys of the kingdom, what are the keys of the kingdom? The keys of the kingdom are you taking your authority and preventing bad things and permitting good things. Because this is what he said. I will give you the keys, the authority of the kingdom of heaven. We serve a risen Christ, a resurrected Christ. He backs up everything. That whenever we use these keys, Jesus backs it up. I will give you the keys, the authority of the kingdom of heaven. Well, what is the authority of the kingdom of heaven? Here's the authority of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind and forbid and declare to be improper and unlawful on earth will have already been bound in heaven. It's bound in heaven. If we get in agreement with heaven and we bind it on earth, then it's bound. And whatever we loose or permit or declare lawful on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. Why? Because there's a risen Christ in heaven that backs up everything that we say and everything that we do that's in line with the word of God. Then, you notice this, then he gave the disciples strict orders to tell no one that he was the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. You guard what's sacred. If Jesus had let this out, if his disciples had blabbed this all over, they wouldn't have wanted to crucify Jesus. They wouldn't have wanted to. Guard what's sacred. I want to present to us how to live our lives united with the resurrected Christ. You talk to him incessantly on the inside. You talk to him about everything. There are some people in this room, you are so bottled up, you, you clam up, you hold everything inside of you. Instead of releasing it to God, you must be in touch always with the resurrected Christ. So what do you do? You blab to him all the time. You talk, 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 talk to him all the time. You talk to him about little things. You talk to him about big things. Most people hold everything inside and think, I've got to solve this. I've got to work this through. And then on the last ditch stand, so to speak, they'll go to Jesus and give it to Jesus. No, we have to be in touch with the resurrected Christ at all times. You know, he not only bore our infirmities and carried away our sicknesses and diseases, but he was fully human. He knows exactly what we're going through. Could we please trust Jesus with our deepest secrets of what, of the anguish maybe that we're experiencing, of the problems that we have? So many people, sometimes you can see it in the spirit, sometimes you can't. So many people are burdened down carrying their own burdens. They're hunched over as they walk, so to speak. If you could see in the spirit, you'd see all these burdens, burden after burden after burden on their back because they carry their own burdens. And they never get in front of the resurrected Christ and go to him and say, Lord, I, I gotta unload. And just sit down and talk to him like a friend. Tell him everything. Tell him what you love. Tell him what you hate. Tell him right where you are at. One of the greatest secrets, I believe, is when you can't do something. Let's say you can't live life. Haven't you ever felt like that? I felt like that. I, I just can't live this life. I just can't. I can't do it by myself, that's for sure. One of the greatest secrets to power with God is guess what? Humbling yourself before God. 
just get so humble and say, Jesus, I can't do this. You've given me an impossible task. Whatever your feelings are, go to him and tell him how impossible life feels to you and then humble yourself. Lord, I humble myself. I humble myself so deeply because I know I can't do life without you. That's walking with the risen Christ. And you know what he'll do? He'll take off your burdens. He'll carry them for you. And he'll answer and solve every problem, every question that you have. Now, I want to give an invitation to our audience, our online audience. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, today is the day to meet him. It's so simple to meet the Lord. You ask him, Jesus, I want you in my life. I give you my life. I ask you into my heart. Be my savior. You need to specify this. When I die, I want to go to heaven and be with you. Let's act like Jesus is the resurrected Christ. Talk to him incessantly. Tell him your hopes and dreams. Then humble yourself before him and tell him, there's no way I can get there. There's no way I can possibly get there, Lord. You're going to have to do it through me.